Okay, welcome everybody to the April Soils Network of Knowledge webinar. This is a special webinar as it marks the 12 month point for the public webinars. I'd like to introduce today's speaker Warwick Doherty, who's presenting today's special first birthday webinar on nitrogen cycling, losses and production responses in intensive pasture systems. Warwick is a researcher and the leader of New South Wales DPI's Soils Unit Southern Team. He's been involved in research and development on the cycling use and loss of nutrients in agricultural systems for 20 years. The particular emphasis of much of his work has been on intensive enterprises like dairying and vegetable production. He also currently leads the New South Wales Dairying Node of the National Agricultural Nitrous Oxide Research Program, as well as contributing to research on nutrient and carbon cycling in cropping systems, in coastal pastures and in systems using recycled organics. Great, thanks Luke and welcome everyone and thanks for attending. Um, so as Luke said, um, this morning we talked about nitrogen cycling um, in intensive pasture systems and as, uh, as Luke mentioned this is part of the NANOLT program which is the National Agricultural Nitrous Oxide Research Program. Um, which is a national program um, looking at nitrous oxide emissions and nitrogen cycling in a range of systems, um, agricultural systems around the country. But um, I'm going to talk about some of the dairy research this morning. Um, I'll principally talk about the work we're doing at Camden in New South Wales, but I'll also touch on some work that Kevin Kelly's doing in Victoria uh, and that Dave Rowlings is doing up in Queensland uh, in dairy systems as well. So just by way of some background, um, to this issue. In dairy production systems, nitrogen is a key driver of productivity, so it's one of the critical inputs um, in dairy production systems that can increase past production. Um, some work that I was involved with with Cameron Gooley and others, a national project looking at nitrogen use efficiency and cycling on dairy farms right around the country, um, showed that nitrogen use efficiency on, on the average dairy farm is 25%, so of the, all of the nitrogen we bring onto dairy farms, only 25% of it leaves the, the farm in product and that's principally in milk on dairy farms obviously. Um, so the whole farm nitrogen use efficiencies is modest I guess at 25%, ranges from about 10 to 50% across um, the dairy farms and so obviously there's a whole lot of nitrogen that, that doesn't leave the farm in product and either leaves via environmental loss pathways or accumulates in systems. And if we could tighten up that nitrogen use efficiency, there's some real economic gains to be made, um, substantial economic gains to be made for the dairy industry. I guess the, the challenge there is that we really have um, poor quantification of the loss pathways for the Australian dairy system, so whilst we understand conceptually where that nitrogen might be going, we actually don't have a good handle on what the quantities are. Dairy soils, as you might imagine, they're typically high in carbon, so uh, much higher than systems like cropping soils for instance, so carbon contents in dairy soils are typically of the order of 4 to 5 percent in the topsoil. We've got high nitrogen inputs, um, the average nitrogen input on a dairy pasture system is about 150 kilos um, per hectare per year across the whole farm and probably on the grazing paddocks is more like around the 200 kilo um, mark. And they tend to have high moisture in the soils either through irrigation or being in high rainfall environments. And so those factors combined um, in, the t in the context of nitrous oxide increase the risk of losses via the nitrous oxide pathway and also through other loss pathways such as leaching. And nitrous oxide is a potent greenhouse gas which is uh, the key reason that the NANORC program exists is to look at how we might better manage nitrogen uh, to reduce that nitrous oxide loss. So the dairy industry um, is looking to improve the nitrogen use efficiency in their systems because it increases um, profitability of the enterprises. Um, they were interested in exploring the opportunities and still are to a degree to participate in whatever an emissions economy, what form that might take. And for um, industries like the dairy industry where there are a lot of focus on export markets is about maintaining that market access as well. So just briefly, um, as I mentioned, there's in the, the NANOLT program there's three dairy sites down in Victoria, there's um, some sites that Kevin Kelly runs um, and up in Queensland at Gympie that Dave Rowlings uh, runs. I'll touch just briefly on a little bit of research from those sites, but principally I'll be talking about the work we do at Camden and the key things we're looking at Camden are the effects of um, urea with and without a nitrification inhibitor, and I'll talk about that more in a moment, um, and the effect of nitrogen rate and the, and the things that we're looking at are nitrous oxide emissions, uh, the effect of those treatments on yield, nitrogen use efficiency and nitrogen leaching. 
So just a very brief summary of, of the methods. I don't want to get into detail here. Um, all these trials that we're running are small plot trials, uh, fundamentally. Um, at our site at Camden, they're five by five metre plots. They're replicated. Um, they're not grazed um, because of the equipment we use in these systems and the complication of having livestock in them. Um, they're mown plot trials, um, and in our system, they're ryegrass, coquilla pastures. They get multiple nitrogen applications a year, um, depending on which of our trials. We're probably looking at about eight applications of, of nitrogen per year um, and for our inhibitors trial, the nitrification trial, which I'll talk about, that equates to about 400 kilos of nitrogen uh, per hectare per year. Uh, it's an irrigated site we run at Camden. We've got um, automated nitrous oxide measurement, so in that top right hand corner you can see the little shiny boxes. Um, that's a system that allows us to measure nitrous oxide emissions, CO2 emissions and, and methane fluxes as well, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, and it's really the Rolls Royce and the goal old standard in terms of being able to do that. Um, we also look at leaching losses, so and the little diagram in the bottom right hand corner showing some plastic tubes which contain intact soil cores uh, that we collected out of our plots. We uh, then cap those, um, those cores at the bottom so we can look at how much water drains out of the soil and what night nitrogen goes along with that water so it gets leached out of the system. And they're growing pasture in, in those uh, cores as well. Uh, and obviously we can look at pasture responses, so we look at yield and quality parameters, and then we can do some calculations around nitrogen use efficiency in these systems. So getting on to um, some summaries of the data, and this is really going to be a very brief summary of the data. Um, the first point um, is to is to make around um, the role of moisture and nitrogen supply and emissions. So this plot shows the little yellow line is the nitrous oxide flux, so that's how much nitrous oxide is coming out of our soil plant system into the atmosphere, um, and the units are grams per hectare per day there, so that's that little yellow trace. The blue line is what we call water-filled pore space, so it's a measure of fundamentally how wet the soil is. So a couple of points, so if you look at this little um, part of those plots there, that you can see that these big peaks we get in nitrous oxide emissions in this case um, are associated with the high moisture content, so you can see the blue line getting up to the 90 to 100% uh, water filled pore space, so the soils are really wet, so when you've got wet soils that's when you're going to get these nitrous oxide emissions. Um, conversely, when you've got relatively dry soils, um, you've got the, the emissions are much lower. You can see those emissions down in that yellow trace in that part of the plot, um, down certainly below five grams per hectare per day. Um, and that's despite the fact that the little red arrows show where we've put fertiliser on. So we've actually put fertiliser on um, in mid-May there, but you can see that despite putting fertiliser on, so having a, a supply of nitrogen, because the soils are not really wet, you don't get emissions. And just to, to highlight that role of um, nitrogen supply, um, this is a plot um, out of our rates trial looking at, again, nitrous oxide flux and grams per hectare per day through um, about an eight-month period. The dark blue line is our control treatment, um, and the light blue line is when we've put 100 kilos of nitrogen on per hectare. Um, in that plot. So you can see when you're putting much more nitrogen into the site, into the system, you clearly get much higher fluxes of, of nitrogen. So the first trial that we ran, um, and we ran this for about 15 months at Camden, um, was looking at the effect of a nitrification inhibitor. So, and the nitrification inhibitor we used was DMPP. So what the nitrification inhibitor in a very simple sense is attempting to do is to slow the, the, uh, the conversion of the urea um, that we put on through to um, nitrogen forms that are likely to be lost via leaching or the nitrification and denitrification pathway. So basically it's trying to slow the nitrogen cycle down fundamentally in a very simple sense. Um, so we ran some work on this at Camden, but it was also uh, um, the product was also tested at Kimpy in Queensland at two sites in Victoria. So what we've got here, there are slightly different rates of nitrogen applied because um, the pasture systems are slightly different. Um, and we've got, you can see, um, basically a comparison between urea and urea plus the DMPP at each of the sites. Um, so the first parameter we're going to look at is at the nitrous oxide emissions. So for each of the sites, you can see that, for instance, at Gympie, Urea, over a 12-month period, we lost 3.73 kilos of nitrous oxide nitrogen per hectare for that period. When we put the DMPP on at Gympie, for instance, it was actually slightly higher at Gympie, 
Um, and you can see that right through for each of the sites. So at Camden, um, spray urea, 2.38 um, kilos of nitrous oxide nitrogen loss. When we add a DP, DMPP, we get a slight reduction. Um, and so on for the Victorian sites. And a couple of points, I guess the first point is there that those numbers are fairly small. Um, the biggest loss of nitrous oxide nitrogen there is four kilos of nitrous oxide nitrogen going off these plots. Compare that when we've put 485 kilos of nitrogen on there. So the first point is the nitrous oxide and nitrogen losses are only a small proportion of the nitrogen cycle. The second point is in going to the far right hand column, and this is now showing the actual um, change in nitrous oxide emissions when you use the nitrification inhibitor. At Gympie, it went up a little bit, not significant. Camden went down a little bit, not significant. Um, at both of the Victorian sites, there was a, a decrease in nitrous oxide emissions when you use the nitrification inhibitor, um, and those differences were significant. But in all cases, um, at most at the Victorian site, it was a 20% reduction in nitrous oxide emissions when you use the inhibitor. But remember that's only 20% of, in that case, 0.58 of a kilo. So the absolute reduction was 0.16 uh, of a kilo, 160 grams of nitrogen. That's how much less nitrogen is lost out of the system. Um, so very variable in terms of the effectiveness of the, the nitrification inhibitors. The effect of nitrification inhibitor on pasture production and nitrogen use efficiency, and of course this is the thing farmers are, are interested principally. Um, and if you can see here, uh, here's our yield data, same layout of the data, urea versus urea plus the nitrification inhibitor. I mean, in all cases, the effect of the nitrification inhibitor is not significant on yield. Um, and that's perhaps not surprising when we think back to the last slide when the differences in nitrogen losses are of only of the order of a kilo of nitrogen. So you're only saving a, about a kilo of nitrogen um, per hectare being lost by that nitrous oxide pathway. And when you think that these products, the urea with the, the nitrification inhibitor, typically have around a 20% price premium, if you're not getting a yield response, then there's a fairly small incentive for farmers to, to use them, given they've got to pay 20% more for the, the product. Um, and again, no difference in the nitrogen use efficiencies in these systems. So um, again, GIMPI, 20 to 23% nitrogen use efficiency, much higher nitrogen use efficiencies in Victoria, but still very small decreases in nitrogen use efficiency. So really in terms of nitrification inhibitors, from the work out of these studies, um, very little evidence that they provide a large reduction in nitrous oxide emissions or a yield benefit. Moving on to our second trial, and now I'll just talk about the Camden data. We're looking at the effect of nitrogen rates on nitrous oxide emissions. And so at Camden, in our replicated trial there, we've got four rates of nitrogen we apply. We apply a control, zero, 25 kilos, 50 kilos, and 100 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per application, remembering that we might be putting around eight applications on per year. So um, fundamentally, after every grazing, we're putting nitrogen on in these systems, depending on the time of year, sometimes we skip. Um, and you can see quite clearly there the control, the dark blue line, gets up to around uh, a cumulative N2O um, nitrogen flux of about a kilo per hectare um, per year, and this is data from a 12-month window. Compare that with the, the 100 kilo treatment where you're now up around four, ki four kilos of nitrous oxide nitrogen being off, so a strong um, end rate response. And we can summarise that, um, this graph on the right now is showing nitrogen application rate on the x-axis versus cumulative nitrous oxide um, nitrogen emissions on the y-axis. Um, and you can see as we shift from the control to the 25 kilo rate to the 50 kilo rate, you get modest increases in nitrous oxide um, emissions. Um, when you get out to the 100 kilo rate, um, then all of a sudden your, your nitrous oxide, nitrogen losses start to increase um, much more rapidly. Um, and I should point out that the typical industry practice would be to apply of the order of 40 to 50 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, so that um, in the middle of that plot really. If we look at the effect of nitrogen rates on emission factors, so the emission factor um, is that proportion of the nitrogen that we put onto the soil that gets lost as nitrous oxide, nitrogen in this case. Um, and so again, so it's, it's comparing each of the treatments to the zero. So for the 25 kilo uh, per hectare treatment, we take away those emissions that you get on the control. Um, so we correct for the background. Um, and you can see for the 25 kilo rate, um, the emission factor is about 0.2%. Uh, 
it almost doubles when you get up to that 50 kilo rate and again when you get out to putting on 100 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per application then your emission factor is again doubling. So it's a fairly linear response in terms of the emission factors uh, to increasing nitrogen application rate. Another way of looking at this data is to look at emissions intensity um, and that's to look at how much nitrous oxide nitrogen gets emitted per tonne of product or per, per unit of product. And in this case we're looking at dry matter pasture production. Um, so you can see for the 0, 25 and 50 kilo nitrogen application rates, the emissions intensity is about uh, that 100, 120 grams of nitrous oxide nitrogen per tonne of dry matter that we grow on these plots. So it's fairly constant through that, um, that range and getting up to the 50 kilo, which as I said is, is pretty typical of what the, the industry would use. When you get out to 100 kilos of uh, nitrogen per hectare per application, your emissions intensity starts to um, increase quite dramatically. So it's double, effectively double that of what it is at the other rates. So the system gets more leaky the more nitrogen you put on. Um, the effect of nitrogen rates on nitrogen leaching, um, we don't have it in Australia, there's not very much data on nitrogen leaching from dairy pasture soils, um, there's probably only one or two other studies that are in the country. Um, lots of evidence from New Zealand that says nitrogen leaching is a big loss pathway and, and of really of primary concern over there. Um, when we look at, at, at this system here, so again we've got nitrogen rates across the x-axis and the amount of mineral nitrogen leached, kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year on the y-axis, so that includes nitrate and ammonium in that, um, that mineral end. And at, at the high end, at the 100 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per application, we're only losing about 7 or 8 kilos of nitrogen per hectare being lost through the bottom of the soil profile, so leaching out of beyond the root zone. Um, and again, if you compare that in, in that 100 kilo per hectare um, treatment, we're probably over a 12 month period put about 800 kilos of nitrogen onto that site. Um, so the mineral, the nitrogen being leached out of these systems is again a fairly small proponent proportion of what we add um, and it increases fairly linearly with the amount of nitrogen we put on. And so of course if you're a farmer, the, the, I guess the end game is really the effect of you're interested in what's the effect of nitrogen rates on yield and nitrogen use efficiency. So this plot shows again the nitrogen rate and the pasture um, dry matter tonnes per hectare over a 12 month period um, at our trial site. And you can see it's a fairly linear response. Um, it varies the slope of that response from harvest to harvest. When we started the trial it was fairly, um, there was no response, so that line was flat for the first couple of harvests and that was probably to do with carryover nitrogen. Um, at times we see this response being curvilinear um, and that will have to do with environmental conditions, but when we look at this data over a 12 month period, strongly linear response, um, we can fit a curvilinear relationship to that, but it's no more. Um, statistically significant than the relationship I fit there. So this, what this says under well-managed systems is that you can actually put quite high nitrogen rates on and get linear responses. If we look at, um, and this is the bottom table here, principally we're interested in this bottom line which is the nitrogen use efficiency of these systems. So this is looking at of the nitrogen we put on, how much of the nitrogen is recovered in, in the plant material over a period of time. Um, so for the 25 kilo rate, you can see that the nitrogen use efficiency down here is 59 cents. So of the nitrogen we put on in that treatment, we get 59 percent of it back in the, the pasture. The other 40 percent is either accumulating in the soil or being lost by the various pathways we've measured. And you can see as we move uh, to the right in that little red box, which is increasing nitrogen rates, the nitrogen use efficiency of the system drops off. So whilst we get a linear increase in pasture production, the nitrogen use efficiency in the system um, decreases. So just summarising all that, so the nitrous oxide emissions from paddocks are relatively small in the context of a dairy system where you put lots of nitrogen on and that's something that, um, that often people are surprised at how small those losses are. There's been a lot of talk about nitrous oxide emissions but that loss pathway is only small from an agronomic perspective and a nitrogen cycling perspective. The leaching losses are also small lower, certainly lower than 10 kilos per hectare and probably for the average system um, of putting on about 40, 50 kilos of nitrogen per hectare around the 5 kilo mark. So only again a small proportion of the nitrogen cycle. 
The nitrification inhibitors are variable in their efficacy, certainly no more than 20% in terms of reducing emissions and the absolute amount of that reduction is small. The impact on yield is very small, um, it's variable um, and fundamentally we can't detect or we haven't detected in these trials and there's no impact on nitrogen leaching. I didn't talk about that data but the nitrification inhibitors themselves don't reduce nitrogen leaching in our systems. Plant yields highly responsive linearly to nitrogen applications in our systems, um, which suggests that in well-managed systems, um, as I mentioned before, that you, you know, perhaps we can, um, in the context of a past production system, produce more um, biomass for consumption by livestock. And applications of up to about 50 kilos per hectare affect efficiency little, so when you're putting on 25 or 50 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, the efficiency really doesn't change um, irrespective of rate there, but once you get up to that 100 kilo rate, the efficiency and the loss pathways uh, do start to increase disproportionately. So if you can think from a farmer's perspective, it's really about um, matching nitrogen supply to plant demand. Um, that has the potential to constrain emissions and some of the other loss pathways that, that might occur. So thanks, and that's just a very brief uh, overview of, of some of the work that we've been doing. Um, as I mentioned, this is part of the National Agricultural Nitrous Oxide Research Program, and you can see at the bottom of that slide there's a, a website address, um, www.n2o.net.au, and that's where all the data from um, these projects that I've talked about today and all the other NANOC projects around the site, all that data and summaries of all the projects sit on that website there. Yeah, so if you want to know more about this project or any of the other nitrous oxide and nitrogen cycling work happening in pasture systems, in the grains industry, in horticulture, uh, go and have a look at that website. And thank you very much. Thanks, Warwick. That was, that was great. Um, very informative. Um, now, if anybody would like to ask a question... If Luke, Lucas has typed a question, so he said, where does all of the nitrogen go? Um, I'm wondering how important the loss is via N2. Uh, if you recall, I talked about even uh, the, the most efficient system we had there was a nitrogen use efficiency of 60%, so 40% of the other nitrogens potentially either accumulating in soil or being lost via the other pathways. So, and Lucas, one of those potential lost pathways in the gaseous cycle is, um, is N2. Um, so I guess we've collected some, we've got samples that we're waiting to get analysed that'll give us some insights into how much N2 is there. N2 is there. There's a lot of talk about how much nitrogen might be lost via N2. Um, in extreme cases, there might be, some people would quote figures of around 70, um, times more nitrogen being lost by the N2 pathway. I, my assessment of that is that's pretty extreme and the number is much more likely to be in the order of, oh, if, without having seen our data yet, my um, educated guess would be that it's more likely to be about five times more than the nitrous oxide. So if we're losing five kilos of nitrous oxide nitrogen out of our systems, um, we might be losing maybe 25 to 50 kilos um, by that N2 pathway, um, but we don't have that data yet. Um, but that's certainly been, in the last six months, a, a topic of you know interest in the NANOL program in terms of trying to quantify that pathway, because irrespective of the systems we've looked at, um, whether they be grains or pasture or horticulture, we can't account for all the nitrogen we're losing out of the systems. Um, so that nitrogen, the N2, is one of the, the potential uh, possibilities. So we hope to have some information on that in, you know, in the next few months. Uh, Warwick, on a more practical level, sort of, I guess for farmers, what are your thoughts about how farmers can synchronise their supply and demand to minimise those nitrogen losses that you've talked about? Um, thanks, Abby. It's, I guess, nitrogen fertiliser use perhaps like a lot of fertiliser use is often based around rules of thumb um, and you know historical trends in fertiliser use. So um, you know there's some good evidence that backs up some of the strategies around nitrogen fertiliser use and the typical rate of 40 to 50 kilos. Um, there's certainly a, a host of experimental work that shows that that's a rate at which you can optimise um, I guess you return on a fertiliser investment. You could, um, there's some work going on in Victoria about developing up some decision support strategies to fine tune that so that 
you might think about rather than using a blanket application of 40 to 50 kilos of nitrogen per hectare each time you put it on, thinking about what your potential growth is depending on time of year um, and seasonal conditions and, and your availability of water for irrigation, those sort of things. So you can predict what your potential yield is and then um, modify your nitrogen rates um, dependent on that. Um, so there's some work developing up um, some, in fact an app, um, Deputy Vicar developing up an app to allow farmers to do that. So just to slightly tweak the decision making process, so that might mean you might decrease or increase your nitrogen um, applications. And there's also some recent work, um, and this is really evolving around a little bit like what they do in the grain sector where you, um, you can look at nitrogen, residual nitrogen in your soil system and account for that, which is something that um, traditionally is not done, but there's some evidence coming out now out of Tasmania that if you understand how much nitrogen is already in your soil, that you can actually again fine tune your, um, your nitrogen application rates. So there's, you know, so it's really thinking about what your potential is, um, how much feed you need to grow, uh, which starts to get complicated when you've got um, a feeding system where you might be thinking about using uh, grains in your system as well. So, so there's certainly some tools around there and thinking about tweaking um, nitrogen application rates. Uh, there's one uh, from Graham Schwenke and he's asked uh, Warwick to comment on the potential losses um, as ammonia volatilised from surface applied urea in a dairy system. Thanks Graham. Yeah, so the ammonia volatilisation, I guess, is one of the other big possibilities of nitrogen loss. Um, and there's, again, there's very limited data on that. We were hoping to um, make some measurements on that this summer on our, in our, some of our dairy systems around Camden. Um, it ended up being such a wet um, summer that it was fundamentally pointless because when you've got lots of continual rain as we had through summer, um, the chances of ammonia volatilisation are, are very low. Some of the work in Victoria, um, there's really two bits of work in Victoria which are probably the only numbers we've got in, um, in Australia on ammonia volatilisation of dairy systems. One of them concluded that losses were 0% and the other one, um, and these are measurements in time, so one concluded for a one month we know that the losses were 0% and at the other one month we know when they looked at it, the losses were around 30%. Um, and if they were 30%, then that starts to account for a huge part of the bit of nitrogen we can't um, account for in our systems. Um, but really, um, so the potential's high, um, but it very much depends on, on the environmental conditions at the time, and that's what happened in Victoria when, when you've got the right conditions, um, so you don't have fertiliser sitting on the soil surface in the dry, windy conditions. You're, um, you're not going to get that volatilisation, but when you've got the right conditions, it could be quite high. So, um, so highly variable and certainly the potential's there, Graham. Um, we just don't have a great deal of data on that again. And unfortunately, we can't make those measures within the trials that we've got because of um, some technical issues. Thanks, Warwick. We've got a question from Lucas again, Lucas Van Sweeten. And it says, uh, is it practical in dairy to add multiple smaller applications of N? This may reduce those spikes after heavy rainfall events, which he's put a question mark after. So I'll be looking for your comments. Uh, I guess potentially it's, it's practical to do. Um, it varies. Um, in Victoria, they, a lot in, certainly in South East Victoria, a lot of the nitrogen goes on by contractors, so they've got very little flexibility because the contractor says, I'm going to come out um, you know, in two weeks' time and I'm going to do your whole farm. Whereas the ideal nitrogen management strategy would say in terms of plant production would be um, to either put the nitrogen on just before grazing or just after grazing. Um, so yes, so you could split nitrogen applications, certainly much more in the New South Wales scenario where the farmers tend to apply their nitrogen. Um, whether you, um, I guess it becomes a cost issue then and a practicality. Most farmers, the single biggest cost on a dairy farm will be the labour cost and if you've got to have, you know, um, if you've got to have stuff spreading, spending more time spreading fertiliser and effectively perhaps doubling the amount of time they spend on the tractor, then it's really probably a cost issue. I don't have the exact numbers on that obviously, but that would be the, the single biggest impediment would just be the cost of uh, applying it. Um, it's not that it's, 
it's not doable, it's just that the cost would become a, a substantial issue. And it would also, there would be an issue as well. Um, the old, the most desirable time to put nitrogen on in these systems, as I said, is just before or just after grazing. Um, that's when effectively the plants are most responsive to it and you get the best pass response. So you probably get a drop off in efficiency um, if you were putting it on you know, two weeks into the regrowth cycle. Thank you everybody for your attendance and a great webinar, Warwick. Special thanks to you. We look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. So bye for now.